Father, truly we are grateful for who you are. We're grateful for how you work. Father, so often the way you work, we don't even see the things that you are doing. We don't even understand fully all that you are accomplishing while you so wonderfully work out your purposes. But we are asking, Lord, here this morning that once again, knit our hearts to you. Teach us why you tell us sin is so bad. How so often we are so narrow-minded of the effects of what our sin does, and yet your word says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. But yet we have you, Lord. No matter what the situation is, that you are greater than that situation. We don't always understand how it is that all things work together for good, but we know that it is true. We know that, Lord, when you speak those words, that they are words that we can anchor in on, regardless of our emotions, regardless of our feelings, regardless of just what we're experiencing, even bodily, Lord, and spiritually, we understand that you're working all these things together for good. And so we trust in you. We trust in how your word speaks. We trust in what it is that you declare. So this morning, once again, give us ears to hear what your spirit would speak to us, your church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love the the, the song that Regan and Marianne opened up with because that song, Yet Not I, But Who Christ in Me, is where the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. It's amazing that so often in the darkest times of our lives, we sometimes wondering what's going on. How is God going to move? Is God working? How is he going to work? And what happens is this, is that so often in our mindset that we are short-sighted in two ways. One, as the instigator of sin, we don't fully understand how far the ramifications of our sin actually go. And we'll be looking at that this morning. The other thing that we sometimes fail to recognize is just um, when we are the victim of that sin, what it is that God can do and what it is that he is doing. Sometimes we see there's no hope. Sometimes we see there's no way. But yet God says what? With God, there is no such thing as a limitation. There's no such thing as impossibility. That's just who God is. And so our our text this morning is found in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Our verse this morning is verse 20. And for those of you that tuned in on Wednesday, you'll realize that this is the first fruits of the ramifications of David's sin. We understand that when David sinned in chapter 11, that eventually it would point out the the, the heinous sins that he had committed. In chapter 12, we would learn that the penalty of those sins committed in chapter 11, the sin and the penalty for that sin would be forgiven it would be wiped out. However, we also learned in chapter 12 that the consequences would not. So you can be forgiven of your sin. You can be forgiven of the penalty of sin. That's Jesus Christ in the cross. That's his blood. His blood is able to cleanse a man from all unrighteousness. And so we stand before God, holy and righteous. But keep in mind that the scripture always also teaches that what you sow, you shall reap. That when you plant, Anything in the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. When you plant to the Spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life. And you can't divorce those two. You can't say, I'm forgiven of my sins, thus I should have no consequences. And and God doesn't do that. He says, no, the sin is forgiven. The penalty of separation from me is forgiven, but the consequences are still there. And one of the consequences that David is now faced with is this, that he's taught his family well. That if your flesh desires something, take it, even if it's forbidden. That's exactly what he taught his family. With Bathsheba, she was the wife of another man. 
I'm going to take her, even if it's forbidden. And this is what he's teaching his children. Also teaching them what? If you have a problem, you know what? Killing people is a way out of it. If you got an issue, just kill them. And this is what he, he is now planted in his family. And this is what his sons are now doing. We understood how Amnon, he had a desire for his sister. He violated her. Then her brother, Absalom, whole brother Absalom, eventually makes a plot and a plan two years later to then murder Amnon. But what we're looking at here this morning is just the consequences of that ramifications of the sin that Amnon did to Tamar. In verse 20, it makes this statement. In fact, I'm going to read verses 19 and 20 so you can see exactly what happens. Tamar put ashes on her head, tore a robe of many colors that was on her, and laid her hand over her head and went away crying bitterly. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? But now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. And then this is our text. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Tamar remains desolate. The term desolate means it's a state of ruin. It's a state of destruction. It means, of course, to devastate. It can also mean to lay waste, but there's a connotation where often it's implied, it, it says to remain depressed. The Bible in basic English translates this verse, 2 Samuel 3.20, this way. So Tamar went on living uncomforted in her brother's house. And this was it. Now keep in mind, we understand as we went into this chapter that Amnon was seeking and longing for a momentary pleasure. He, he just, he wanted his sister a momentary pleasure. And what happened is he not only inflicts this initial instant pain and harm and distress upon his sister, but this one heinous act will also cause a long-lasting pain, harm, suffering, all of this is going to go on, and these consequences are going to remain with Tamar in some, some of these consequences for the rest of her life. So for Amnon, it was a moment. We're done. But for Tamar, those consequences that happened to her were absolutely incredible because they would last her entire life. And we'll be looking at that a little bit here this morning. So I want you to understand that this message here this morning is not meant to be an all-encompassing, one-size-fits-all to the sins done to anyone. That's not what this message is, but it is to look at the biblical truths as we can glean here from Tamar and the sin that was wrought upon her. So we can do that at least this morning. I want you to understand that when she comes to this place of being violated, that we can recognize that at this point, her, her doubts of her safety are now raging within her. If I can't be protected in my father's own house, if I can't be protected from my family, these doubts of her safety are now going to just escalate. I don't know if you've ever had something stolen from you, but when someone steals something right out of your garage or comes in your there's a violation, and you you have this panic of is am I safe? Can I you know is, is doing this? Well, the sin that was done upon her is bringing that same truth. Her trust, her trust in her family, her trust in her dad, who said, "Yeah, go make the loaves for your for your brother." Her her trust for her brother herself, and Amnon, and also her trust for her brother Absalom. Because look at what Absalom says to her in verse twenty. He says, "Oh." Has Amnon been with you? And, and, and he, he violated her. And has he been with you? He says, but now hold your peace, my sister. He's your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. You understand you can't trust 
that kind of attitude when they say, it's just, just write it off. It's not so bad. And I think it's important to realize that here her physical and her emotional well-being are shattered at this point. And so I think what happens is how often are we seeking to find some kind of meaning and find some kind of understanding in that kind of suffering? Now, I don't know if you've ever, you know, suffered those things, but, but when that happens, you try to say, what's, what kind of meaning can I find? What kind of understanding can I glean from this? Why is this thing done? Why did I have to go through it? And that's what she's going through right now. She's having to go through this and to realize that at this point, that there, there's no one that's assisting her. She's on her own. Now, she's able to be in her brother's house, but what happened is that, you know, that Bible in basic English, and she remained uncomforted. The term that she stayed desolate in her brother's house, that she was in ruin. She was devastated. She laid waste. And so I think it's important to recognize what was going on. Now, for you note takers, two truths. There are two truths, and you can't write one without the other. The first truth is this. Sin is in the world. I hate to say it, it's just going to happen. None of us are exempt from it. In some form or another, we're going to reap the consequences of sin, whether it's those close to us or someone we may not know, but in the selfishness, in the attitudes, anything that we do that is a lack of love. God gives us two commandments, love him, love people. And, and, and love doesn't seek its own. Love seeks the other person's well-being. And I find this interesting that what happens is, here in this place, we come face to face with this first and brutal truth. Sin is in the world. Even those that are of your own family, even those that you love, even those that you should trust, sin happens because it's in the world. And there are going to be times where it's going to be a physical act. Sometimes it's going to be a verbal word that's going to rip you apart, that's going to devastate you. Keep in mind, sin is in the world. That's the first truth. The second truth is just as needed is this. She's not alone. She may not have her brother. She may not have anyone else, but God is with her. He will never leave her nor forsake her. And so it's important to recognize that she is not alone. And so God, no one else does, and even more than she does, God understands her suffering. And these are the truths you have to take home because what happens is this. God understands the myriad of ramifications this one sin has done to her and what it has caused, what it's going to bring out. And so I want you to just kind of go through and, and recognize with me where Amnon takes this one moment of just fulfilling the lust of his flesh and, and violating his sister, and then this is what's happening now. The first thing that happens to her is this. Even before she comes into her, his room, she's objectified that he says, I want my brother Absalom's sister. Do you understand? Now, if, if her brother Absalom, if his brother Absalom is his brother, then what does that mean? Well, his brother Absalom's sister, that's his full sister, it's his sister too. It's his half-sister. But he needs to what? He needs to lessen her. He needs to objectify her. He needs to make her not... God's child. He needs to make her not as precious. He, he needs to not respect her. He needs to not give her the dignity. He needs to not give her the honor. He has to move her to a place of an object so that I can have my will. Because if it's someone who's important, if it's someone not that you say is important from your heart, you know is important, if it's God's child, and if you do the commandment to love then what? There is going to be this honor. There is going to be this dignity. There is going to be a respect that is given to that person. And I think what happens is this, is she's just objectified. She has, he's not respecting her. There is no dignity. There is no honor. And so when we look to this, 
Tamar is his sister, but he doesn't even want to go there. And so Abnon moves Tamar from being his, his sister and from being forbidden fruit to being what? Oh, it's just an object. And I can do what I want with an object if it's an object that I want. And so it's amazing that even though that that relationship that he desired with his sister was forbidden, he twisted in his mind, he did these mental gymnastics to reduce her to a point of being an object. And all this, no fault of hers. Keep in mind, this is no fault of hers. Not only does he first make her an object, he objectifies her, and then what happens, there's this physical violation and this physical trauma that begins to happen to her, and the pain and the fear and the shame and the helplessness. All these things are going on, and these these physical scars and, 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 and emotional scars and spiritual scars, all this thing, can you imagine that that fear and the panic and the helplessness because he just simply stronger than she is he's going to simply say i can do what i want to do and so that that fear that helplessness that that where's my safety all those things are going on with this physical violation and trauma and then from the physical then it brings into the what to the emotional and now you got to live with it. Now your brain keeps thinking, was, did I do something? Was it something of my fault? What's going on here? Keep in mind that at this point, her honor was stolen. Her honor was stolen through no fault of her own. And, and it was a betrayal by her own family member. Can you imagine that this, this what's going on in your mind, in your heart? Here's someone I'm supposed to, who's supposed to, take care of me, and I should trust, and I should love that you're going to love me in the way that's right and, and proper according to Scripture, and you're not, and you can't feel safe. You, you can't feel comforted, and at this point, what begins to happen is through this emotional trauma that is here, she now has to doubt her brother. I can't trust Amnon. I can't even trust Absalom, my brother, because he says, oh, it's okay, just kind of write it off. No big deal. Don't say anything to anybody. Just, just, it'll be okay. Hold your peace. Do not take this thing to heart. What horrible advice. And at the same time, what? Her trust even with her dad. He's the one who said, hey, yep, yep, go to your brother, make the cakes in this house. And so the, the trust is now, who do I trust? If I can't trust these men in my life, who do I go to? Who do I trust? And, and it is so incredible that with this anguish, with this distress that she's beginning to experience, after her initial response to this act that was done. What we begin to see is this. She's told to bottle up your emotions. You don't need to cry about this. It's, it's you know, I, I'm in charge here. We're good. We've got this covered. And, and the bottom line is, no, you don't. Because you got your best interest in, in mind. You don't have my best interest. You don't have my heart. You don't have what I'm going through at all. And so keep in mind that there is this, you know, first objectification of physical trauma, emotional trauma that comes. And then along with this, keep in mind that through no fault of her own, she now has a social stigma. She comes to this point where this physical violation that was done to her it's not going to, even though it's it's over, it's not going to negate the disgrace. It's not going to negate the, the shame. It's not going to, that, that area where her position of worth in the eyes of potential suitors is now gone. And all this, she has a social stigma of what are people going to think about me? Are they going to believe my story? Are they going to think that I had something to do with this. And, and this is that issue with this kind of trauma. 
You have no one that will listen, no one to to do that. And and keep in mind that her position, how people look at her in society is going to be diminished. It's going to be lessened. And all this, once again, through no fault of her own. On top of this, what we saw was this, and this is, this is brutal, that she lost the opportunity to marry and have a family. Unbelievable, because of one man's selfish act. That's what it says here at the end of verse 20. Tamar remained desolate. She remained uncomforted. She remained in a place of ruin and destruction in her brother's house. She could never experience the, the, the love of the engagement and the marriage and, and the, 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 the life of a wife and a husband, the joys that can come through that, the, the birth of children. All this because her brother said, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm, I don't care if it's right. I don't care if it's wrong. I don't care if it's sin. I don't care if it's not. I'm going to do what I want to do. Do you understand how sin, the ramifications go beyond just that moment? It goes on and on and on. I don't know if you've ever counseled with someone, or maybe you yourself have experienced it, or you've heard it from someone else, where there may be a couple in a marriage. And what will happen is this, there will be an argument. And in the argument, one couple will say something to the other couple that is just brutal. Brutal. And do you know what will happen? The enemy is going to back up that tape and play it, back up that tape and play it. Oh, I guess, no, back up the DVD, back up the MP3. I'm so old. He's going to just rewind it again and again and again. And you're going to hear those words again and again and again. And, and they're going to apologize for it. Oh, I'm sorry I said that I didn't mean it. But you know what? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we know those things that the enemy is going to use this again and again and again and again. Be careful. This is why God says, be careful of every word that proceeds from your mouth. He, he holds you accountable. At, there, there, there's not just a moment, but it goes on and on and on. And so think about sin. Think about what it does. And the other thing that we see is not only does she have this lack of a family, this lack of a husband, I want you to understand this. She has no justice. There is no accountability to what her brother did. They just simply, David is just angry. He's not going to correct him. He's not going to teach him. He's not going to discipline him. Amnon's life can go on. And guess what? Like nothing ever happened. What's going on with her life? She's in a place of desolation. She's in a place of, of, of just pain and, and, and this area of being not comforted. And I think it's so interesting that, that what happens is this, you know, and then he has a stigma of being a fool, but he faces no real instant consequences. He faces no um, ramifications for his actions. It's just passed on. And so not only is she betrayed by her brother, she's betrayed by her father. Her father doesn't say, yeah, something has to be done. This was a wrong, nothing. You see nothing in scripture about that. And so nothing is done to acknowledge the immense gravity of the act that was done to Tamar. And she has to live with it. She has to live with it. And if anyone was looking to say, what, what kind of, of reaction should we have to her? I want you to understand here, look at verse 18 of our text. It says in verse 18, now she had on a robe of many colors for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel, and his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. And Tamar put ashes on her head. She tore her robe of many colors. So this robe that put her in a station of honor, it was a representation that she was this daughter of the king. It had long sleeves. 
long thing. So she wasn't the one to work. The, the workers, they would have the shorter sleeves and then the shorter you know, outfit so they could bend and work and their sleeves wouldn't get in the way of their arms. And so she rips it. She literally tears this robe that's there, the robe of many colors, and she put ashes on her head. She's just mourning. She doesn't even want beauty anymore. She wants the world to see her as she feels on the inside. I feel so dirty. I want the world to see the dirt, the ashes. She puts her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. Anguish, anguish, anguish. And I think what's so important is then her brother comes and says, hey, don't worry about it. But I think what's interesting, her initial reaction of this physical and emotional hurt, she has this, this, this deep, deep pain and the loss of her honor, the loss of all that she had taken herself to protect. And, and so she has this sorrow and this immense grief and the depths of the shame and the lack of worth. There's the, the, the stripping of her honor was dramatic. It was not just this gradual thing. It was just forceful thing done instantly. And then she's told in verse 20, hey, don't worry about it. Hold your peace. You don't have to tell anybody. It's all okay. Just, just keep it in. Don't worry about it. And then I think what happens is she's just told to, to, to hold her peace. She's told to keep silent. She's told not to express her sorrow. Can you imagine that? This deed that was done, and it's like it's like a, a football guy that falls down and gets scraped. The coach says, "What? Hey, you know, brush it off. Get up. You're fine. This isn't a football injury, and he's not the coach." She's devastated here, and what happens is she's told not to express her pain. She's told not to take the matter to heart. She's implying that the damage that was done was not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not as bad as you're making it out to be. It's as bad as she's making it out to be. Her reaction's correct. Everyone else's actions are wrong. And there's no one, no one that she could share her hurt and her pain with. She can't go to her dad. No, no, it's Amnon. Amnon's fine. He's okay. We don't want to correct this. And I think what's amazing is there's no one to give her any reassurance that it wasn't her fault. No one is saying that this, this wasn't on you. This wasn't on you. And, and there, there should be some kind of accountability. There should be some kind of justice that's here. But there's no sympathy for her at all in this text. And I'm astounded by just how sin permeates. No one looks at this area. No one wants to do it. There's no sympathy for her. There's no one to support her emotionally. There's no real protection for her. She's shoved in her brother's house, and that's it. There's no path that she can take to have justice. There's no path that she can take to have accountability done. And if there's no justice, guess what? That makes the path for healing even more difficult to go through. Because one of the healing is what? Well, at least there is a penalty for what you've done. I'm hurting. You have to hurt in some way. There should be some kind of consequences. And, and so with this, there's no path for healing. And, and ultimately, there's no path for restoration. How do you begin to do this? And so the question comes is, is what can she do? What can we do when it comes to these situations? Well, The first part of it was what? Sin is in the world. The second part is this, you're never alone. That no matter what, and I think this is so important, that there can be, when you are a Christian, you can experience divine presence and divine comfort. If there's no one else, there's no one else, there's Jesus. This, this is the key. And so, God himself can come in your heart, and God himself can bring about a renewal. And so God can bring justice. God can bring accountability. And when you put these in his hands, you trust in him. God can bring about people to support you. 
God can bring in those people to help guide you through this. And, and, and someone that, that as you go through this, you can learn to find a strength. You can learn to find this, this area of hope in God, but only in God. And I think what's so important is that, that God, at this point, uses Tamar's suffering here that happened thousands of years ago as an eternal lesson and one that is applicable to you and I today. You have to understand this lesson is not something, oh, that was done then. I'll tell you what, this attitude is pertinent and prevalent and rampant today. The attitude of, oh, it's just that. Don't worry about it. Shake it off. And, and I think what happens is that here the scriptures teach us, and I think it's so important to grab one thing out of this. I don't care who you are. Sin has a longer lasting ramification than you will ever know. It's not just today. It's not just a moment. And you can say, oh, I apologize and everything's okay. I'll tell you what, the enemy is going to just keep bringing those things back and bringing those things back. Sin has a longer lasting ramification than you will ever know. And it's not going to just affect you. It's not going to affect that person you're sinning against. It spreads. And so we begin to see here, and I want you to recognize that the world itself is suffering. I don't care where you look, you're going to see pain. The world itself, it's, we're, we're in the throes of sin. The world itself is suffering. There are people suffering in other countries. There are people suffering in this country. There's probably your own family members. You know people that are suffering. So what do you do with that? Well, the amazing thing is this, and this is where I think it's so important, that when you have this, people are going to deal with their suffering in different ways. There, there's going to be some people that will um, seek to forget their suffering, pretending like it never happened. Oh, I'm just going to just go on like it never happened. But what happens is what? <laughs> You, you haven't dealt with it. You haven't healed from it. You've buried it. And every so often, what? The enemy is going to lift up the rug and say, here it is. Oh, man, I'm going to forget. Put the rug back down. I'm going to forget that it happened. And people try to do that. They try to say, I want to forget that this thing has ever happened. I'm going to pretend like it's not so bad. Some people, they suffer in silence. They hold it in. And they hold it in. And they suffer. And they suffer. And they suffer. Some. Some will seek guidance to get through it. Some will seek counsel. Some will seek those people to come through. Some will actually, and this is an amazing thing, will learn to find strength and hope. They will find, I'm stronger than I ever thought I knew. I'm stronger than this sin with Christ in me. And they're going to find strength and they're going to find hope in the presence of God in that situation, when they go through the suffering and they cling to God, it's like, you know what? I can get through today. I can get through today. I can get through the moment because God holds me. God has me. And, and what happens is this. The more you run to God and you find your strength in him, the more you're going to realize is I've never been alone. Now, God understands there's sin in the world. God understands those things. And so the, 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 the question is, is when we come to this point, is how do we find hope in impossible circumstances? How is God going to get me through this? <laughs> One thought for you. Remember the book of Exodus? Children of Israel are leaving Egypt. They find themselves in an impossible situation. You got the Red Sea and you got the Egyptian army. What are we going to do? I'll be honest with you. God will make a way. They pass through the Red Sea on dry ground. Incredible. They pass through. The, God, God can do the impossible. Don't think that there is a situation that's not, that is impossible for you to walk through, that God can't give you a path to walk. Remember that. Remember Jericho, the walls. We can never get these down. Don't worry. If you just walk around it, 
blow the trumpet, look to me. I'll take care of the big stuff. You just focus on me. And this is God. This is his heart. And I think this is what's so important to deal with. And so when we come to, to recognize how do I deal with this hurt? A couple of passages. I want you to jot them down if you're a note taker. You don't have to turn there. The first one you guys know. You know the passage. You may not know the address. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Every time it comes, you just cast your cares. You cast your cares. Like, Lord, this is before the cross now. You died for this sin. You died for these things. You died because you know sin is in the world. And I don't have to be alone. Why? Because you died for my sins and you've knit me back to uh, an intimate relationship with you. And I think it's important to recognize I can cast my cares on why? Because he cares. He understands suffering and injustice. Isaiah 53, you guys know this, right? As a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. Our iniquity was laid upon him. And and it was amazing that that for for the Lord to say, you know what, I'm going to put all this, all of Lowell's sins and all of your sins upon the Lord. And he said, I'm going to take it to the cross and I'm going to pay the penalty of death. I'm I'm going to literally be separated from my father. He understands how sin is. As at that passage in Hebrews chapter 4, um, in, in verses 14 through 16, he makes that statement of he's that high priest who sympathizes with us. Let me just read it to you. I want to read verses 14 through 16. Seeing we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us boldly come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you have a need, there's a high priest, Jesus, who sympathizes. There's a high priest who knows what you've been through. And I think what's so important is this, that when we see here what the Lord wants us to learn from this, there's a passage at the end of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61. I want to read a couple of verses to you just so you can kind of function and, and, and understand the flow of this. Within this chapter of Isaiah chapter 61, I'm going to start by reading verse 3. Now, you, you already know part of this. You're already going to be responding to part of it. But I want to read verse 3, and then I'm going to back up to verse 1, and then I want to read this passage and just stop periodically so that you can really understand what it is that that Jesus here is and what he does. Verse 3, this is one of the reasons Jesus came. Isaiah 61, verse 3, to console those who mourn, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. To understand that that what he is wanting to do is this. Now you think about here, think about Tamar for just a second, to console those who mourn. That's why he came to console those who are mourning. And then he says this, to give them beauty for ashes. Remember there in our text, verse 19, she put the ashes on her head. He says, because that's how I feel. He says, I'm going to give you beauty instead of those ashes. I'm going to give you uh, that you will understand how beautiful you are to me. The oil of joy for mourning. Do you understand how God can take these things away and, and literally transfer them? The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You understand this passage, if, you, if you're there in, in, in Isaiah 61, verse 3, just write down 2 Samuel, chapter 13, verse 20, Tamar. God is able to do this. Now, I want to back it up. I want to start reading from verse 1 so you can understand the flow of what Isaiah 61 actually says. It says, the Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Good news for the brokenhearted. Good news to those who are hurting. 
He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Sin cannot hold you. Someone else's sin cannot define you. Do you understand? Your defining yourself is in Christ, not in your sin. And this is what's so important. I find it interesting that when you go to certain meetings and they say, hey, I'm so-and-so and I'm this, and, and they, they label their sin. And, and what they will do is they, they identify themselves with their sin. And, and there's nothing wrong because, you know, one of the things you got to do is you got to know that you're a sinner. So that, that's fine. I don't mind that. But when you continue to identify yourself as that sin that either you do or the sin that was done upon you, don't say, hey, I'm Lowell and I'm a victim. I'm Lowell and I'm an alcoholic. I'm Lowell and I'm a sinner. I'm Lowell and I am the son of God. That's who I am now. That's how I define myself now. Not, not who I was, but who I am. And as we go to this, I think it's so important what we see here. He makes this statement. I'm going to proclaim liberty to captives, open the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the vengeance of our God. There will be accountability to those who have sinned. It's going to happen. Now, it's either one of two things. Either Jesus will have paid that price for them, like he paid the price for my sin as well. Keep in mind that when, when you say that person can't be forgiven because of what they did, listen, that's what the enemy says to God about me too. You can't be forgiven because of what you've done against God. And God says, oh, yes, you can, because I love. And, and we recognize here that, that the same way that he forgives me, he can forgive others. But if they don't come to Christ, they are going to deal with their own sin the same way as if I don't. And so it's important to recognize that what we see is this. Now, he says at the end of verse 2, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion. So he says, I'm going to comfort all who mourn, everyone in every place, especially those who are there of my children in the millennium. And he says, now to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. No longer does she have to have that coat of many colors. It's ripped, it's torn. He's going to give her a brand new garment of praise a brand new garment of honor, a brand new garment of dignity because Jesus gives us what? He gives us a robe of righteousness. That's incredible that we can stand before God. And so it's that beautiful robe to come into the wedding feast. And so, but he says this, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. Everything that is ripped apart, everything that's devastated in your life, guess what? He's going to rebuild it. He's going to make it new. He's going to rebuild the old ruins. They shall rise up the former desolations. So everything that was torn down, he says, we're going to make it new again. Everything that's wrecked, we're going to restore it. And I think what's interesting is when we take a look at this, it says this, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolation of many generations. I don't know if you've ever had certain sins that went through your family. Grandfather, father, you. You know, there are certain sins that, well, my grandfather drank, my father drank, and I got my first beer at four. You know, it just those, those things happen. And, and, and I don't care how many we begin to see how many generations that this desolation has continued. Guess what? He can break, he can break the chain. He can break that pattern and he can restore it fully and completely in him. And it says this, strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. The sons of the foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. You shall call, they shall call you the servants of our God, and you shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, notice this, instead of your shame, you shall have a double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in the portion. And this is what sin does. It brings the shame, it brings the confusion, and God says, Jesus can restore that. Instead of the, this, this confusion, look and see what God is doing. Look and see how God is going to use this. <clears throat> Instead of shame, 
recognize that he's giving me what a place of honor there with him. Then it says this, and therefore in their land they shall possess double, everlasting joy shall be theirs. This is the restoration of what God does. And so I think it's important to recognize here is the Lord. Everything that he's doing is to bring about a restoration. Now, one other passage I want to read to you is actually found in Philippians chapter 4. There's three verses to look at. Beginning in verse 11, it says this, Not that I speak in regard for a need, for I have learned in whatever state that I am in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in everything I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Regardless of the situation I find myself in, whether it's a situation of having joy and having peace and abounding in things or having none of that, guess what? I find my soulless in Christ, and and I, I find it in Him, and He's my peace. He's what I have, and so I recognize that what I need is I need Him. And so a lot of times the question is, is this, why? do we have to go through sin? Why do we go through that? One of the things that I've known in my own life personally, and I've seen in many, many mature Christians as well, that God allows us to go through and experience sin done to us and the pain of that sin and not really have any other peace about it other than God being with me and God being my hope is this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, there's such a powerful passage. And I want to read to you just a couple of verses. In verse 3, it says this, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all, all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. And now keep in mind, it doesn't comfort us in some of our tribulation. He doesn't comfort us in most of our tribulation. He comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which with we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so the consolation also abounds through Christ. When we go through sin, the experiences of sin, when we go through the consequences of someone sinning against us, one of the things that we can do is this. God in time, when you come to God and you find comfort in God, comfort in his word, comfort in in worship, when you find strength in God to get through that day, and then you find the strength gets you through two days, you know, and it just builds and builds, one day, one day God is going to bring to you someone who needs to grow like you have grown, someone who doesn't know the answer, someone that doesn't know of Jesus, someone that doesn't know that there can be a hope, someone that doesn't know that there can be a strength, and you're going to be able to comfort them. And what happens is this. I don't know if you've ever talked to someone who has no idea what you've been through, and they are the perfect ones to give you advice. Like the people who have never had kids, say, I know what to do with kids. Or better yet, the person who's only had one kid. My wife was talking about this person who had one kid, an amazing kid. Like, <clears throat> yeah, you can't put all the kids in the same thing. If you have more than one kid, you realize you have, what, eight personalities in there. That's just the way kids are. They're, they're not all going to be the, 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 the perfect firstborn, everything is all good. There, there comes the, the second, the third, and you know, and on and on, and 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 in our case, you know, seven, and they weren't all alike. They were all completely different. They had some things the same, other things completely different. But what happens is this: you can tell them, I can tell you that this is where strength is. I can tell you where this is where comfort is because I have been where you are. And that is going to speak volumes. 
And so even though you may not have ever had the that benefit of having justice done and and the, the you know where where you realize man justice was done and it was paid and I can wipe that off the table and or, or you recognize that that now I can come back and I can restore a relationship and I can have trust again and I can peace again I feel safe again if you've never had that but you've only had God you've only had Jesus in your life what happens is this and this is the most amazing thing is that God allowed you to go through it and to go to him and find the comfort and find the strength because he knew that he would need you one day to comfort this other person that didn't know where to find strength, that didn't know where to find hope. And I'll be honest with you, that you can latch on to, that you can receive the comfort from God and then you can comfort others with the same comfort wherein you were comforted. And if nothing else happens, if you can be used by God to help someone recognize that Jesus is their hope and Jesus is their strength and Jesus is their healing and Jesus is their wholeness and Jesus is their restoration, could you say, okay, Lord, if I have to go through this, that one day you would use me to help someone else along the path? To be honest, my answer for just me, you work that out in your own relationship with God, but my answer for just me is yes, Lord. If you could use me in any way to draw someone closer to you, to rely on you, find peace in you, and strengthen you, because what does Galatians 6 2 says? Bear one another's burdens. It's so important that this is what we do. And so I think it's important when we come to this passage and we realize just what it means here in, in 2 Samuel 13 20. Tamar remained desolate. She remained broken. She remained violated. She remained all these things and uncomforted. All these things she remained. But I'll, I'll be honest that, that we can learn so many things. Sin is in the world, and the ramifications are more than what you think. When you speak something, you have no idea how deep and how long those ramifications will go. When you do something, you have no idea just how they become a domino effect. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. But what God's able to do is this. He's able to say, I, I can be with you. I will be your source of strength. And you will find that you are stronger than you know. You will find that there will be a healing, a restoration. So much so that when they're, I'm going to bring someone else to you that's going to go through this, that needs to know where to find the hope, where to find the strength. May we recognize, yes, devastation comes, desolation comes because sin is in the world, but, but we are never alone as Christians. God is with us. Amen. So, Father, we're so grateful that even in this passage where it's not a happy promise, Lord, but yet it is a passage that is a reality of our world. Sin is in this world. Sadness is in this world. Pain is in this world. We will experience, others will experience, but yet we can come to you, Lord. We can come to you in, in your strength. We can come to you in your power. We can come and be restored. And so, Lord, we understand that, that when the night is dark, we will not be forsaken. When it looks like everything is ended, you are going to part the sea and make a way and, and allow us to come and worship you and honor you, to be safe with you and secure with you, to have dignity with you and honor. And so, Father, do the work. Teach us, Lord, that... that be careful of what we do when we sin because it goes far beyond the moment. Teach us how you want us to love one another. And then if we are experiencing that kind of pain, Lord, teach us that we will find the strength in you, the peace in you. We commit it all to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, amen. So.